Um, so, yeah, my name is Tron. Uh, most of you or many of you know me. Um, I've been in Bitcoin since about uh, 2013, early 2013, kind of the big first San Jose conference, um, and been doing uh, mining, investing, uh, working. I now work here for Medici Ventures, which is a kind of a venture capital that's funding a very, various uh, Bitcoin companies. Uh, you may have heard of some of them, Bit and Ripio, or a couple of them. So, um, before I get started on the, the thing, I'm going to address the kind of the, the elephant in the room is the Bitcoin price today is, is uh, dropped quite a bit. Uh, it was, the rumors were confirmed uh, for the uh, Chinese uh, shutting down exchanges. Uh, you can see it online. Uh, you can see the, the money kind of being taken out in China. It's already down to like the equivalent of 2,800 while it's still about 3,200 in the US. So it's kind of being arbitraged down. So just wanted to kind of bring that up. Um, I will, uh, I would like to take questions kind of maybe in the middle. Um, if you do have a, an important question, raise your hand. I'm happy to answer questions and definitely at the end. So uh, the topic today is uh, trading ICOs. Uh, the rewards and risks of flirting with IPO's promiscuous cousin. Uh, so let me get started. So I had a theme uh, set up for this. Uh, and as I was trying to put together a theme for it, I decided uh, some of the stuff wasn't HR friendly, wife friendly, whatnot. So, so this will kind of be the only part that, that kind of matches this theme. Um, so IPOs uh, is an initial public offering, uh, so a stock that's, that's issued uh, on NASDAQ or, or New York Stock Exchange, for example, uh, would be protected by a lot of regulation, filings, quarterly filings, a lot of, uh, a lot of things go into to an IPO before uh, it's issued. Um, an ICO, they're starting to get regulation, uh, but when I wrote this, uh, this talk, uh, that there wasn't a lot. Um, but, but they're starting to get some more regulation now. Um, but it is uh, more difficult to regulate. Um, so what is an ICO? Uh, so the, the term is an initial coin offering. Uh, it's not a great term uh, because it, it will kind of bring down, it sounds too much like IPO. It kind of brings down the ire of the, of the SEC. But it's basically a token that isn't mined into existence like Bitcoin or Litecoin but is sold into existence like a stock. So some, they say, uh, we're gonna issue this. Uh, it takes on a market value, uh, sometimes uh, set. Uh, there's different um, mechanisms for setting that, that initial value, uh, but that, it comes into the existence. But other than that, it works uh, very much like uh, Bitcoin, or if not, it rides on top of, of uh, Ethereum or Omni or one of these other um, tokens. Um, ICOs also become synonymous with an altcoin. They are a little bit different because of the way they're sold into the market. Uh, so it can be a token that's pre-mined and has its own proof of work or proof of stake uh, just because of the naming confusion. Um, it's also commonly a token that's built on top of Ca Counterparty or Omni, Open Assets, NAM, Colored Coin, Ethereum, or now NEO is another popular one. Um, uh, so most of the tokens that come out into existence, at least in the United States, uh, have been built on top of ERC tw or, or ERC-20 compatible, which is just sort of a standard contract, smart contract within Ethereum. So uh, this is a new slide that wasn't there for, for when I first gave this presentation in one of our med talks, um, but because pretty much everyone in our group kind of knows why, uh, why we do this, but uh, why trade or buy and hold ICOs. Uh, one of the reasons is just when they sell the token, a lot of times they don't know uh, what that value is going to be. And a lot of times it has a, uh, a, long, a long way to go up. Uh, so Ethereum is kind of the, one of the, the, the stars in this space. But uh, it, when it came out originally, it was about 30 cents. It's, uh, <laughs> as of yesterday, it was about $300. It's down now, uh, you know, for the same reason that Bitcoin is, uh, the, the Chinese are selling aggressively. Uh, Civic is another one. It's recent, a couple months, went from uh, 10 cents to 70 cents. Uh, if you look at it now, it's down again for the same reason. Um, Bcap is another one. Bcap is uh, a more regulated one. Uh, it's actually uh, Pierce, uh, Brock Pierce. Uh, who has a venture fund and he chopped that up and, and did uh, follow the regulations that the SEC require for at least for the US and sold to everybody else uh, around the world. Uh, and they raised $10 million in just a few hours uh, at $1 per token. 
Um, so there's some spectacular gains. There's a whole bunch of different ones. You can you know, kind of browse them yourself at CoinMarketCap. Before I, uh, before I go on, let me ask a question, just kind of get a survey. How many, how many people own Bitcoin already? Okay, most. Um, how many own uh, an ICO, something, an altcoin, or ones that are kind of initial? That, 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 okay, and how many, how many bought those during the initial offering instead of on an exchange? Okay, about maybe a third. Okay, thank you. Um, so not all of them are winners. Uh, you know, as they as they come out, uh, you know, some of them have failed. Not many, uh, but uh, some of them are are scams. Uh, so on that part, uh, you need to do your research. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the trading strategies. So uh, this is for tokens that have already been been issued, uh, and you want to um, to trade them. So these are the, the uh, five trading strategies I'm going to talk about. Buy and hold, general trading, day trading, technical trading, and bot trading. And I think I clicked in the wrong place. Okay. Uh, so buy and hold. Uh, this is uh, probably the easiest strategy. Uh, I'll show you where, if you, if you haven't already done it, uh, I'll show the, the places you can go and buy these. Um, but it's an easy strategy. Uh, you go and, and uh, you, you need to start somewhere. You need to start with Bitcoin. Uh, in the US, the easiest place to start is, is probably Coinbase or Gemini. Uh, you can link a bank account or use a debit card uh, and get Bitcoin because you need to start with, with some sort of cryptocurrency to trade most of these. Um, and then you want to cho choose good coins with the future. And I'll talk about more on that later. Uh, you just buy through the site, you trade uh, at the market value, you store it safely, and you wait. So that's a, a simple strategy. Um, general trading. Uh, so you can choose trading pairs. Uh, so trading pairs might be like Bitcoin against Ethereum or Ethereum against Litecoin, something like that. Uh, and you buy when you think it's low and you sell when you think it's high. Uh, so uh, right now would probably be, if I had to guess, uh, one of the lows. <laughs> Um, because of what's going on right now. Um, but I don't know where the bottom is. Uh, I've had a lot of texts today and phone calls asking me where the bottom is, uh, just because I, I consult with a lot of people and talk to a lot of people. Uh, my answer is I, I don't know. Um, I obviously don't know because I bought at multiple points on the way down. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I don't know where the bottom is. I'm not sure we're at the bottom. Um, and then sell when you think it's high. So this is actually going in and out of the market, trying to gain uh, more Bitcoin or more of whatever, whatever uh, trading pair you're, you're after. Uh, the timing's tough. Uh, sometimes there's patterns that emerge. Um, when I gave this talk for about two or three weeks in a row, uh, everything went down on, on Friday and everything was way up on Sunday. But what ends up happening is people recognize those same patterns and so everybody says, oh, I'm gonna buy on Friday and then sell when it's high on Sunday. And that automatically, because people are doing that, will invert that trend. So of course, then after everybody recognizes the trend, sure enough, the next Friday it was high and Sunday it was low. So um, the, the trends tend to evaporate or reverse after you see them a few times and enough people recognize a pattern. Uh, so trading strategy, day trading. It's a little bit different. It's trying to recognize daily trends and sentiment uh, and trade in very short intervals. Uh, so you can look and it looks like it's going up today. So you'll kind of get in and try to ride it up. Uh, one of the things that kind of distinguishes day trading from just general trading is a lot of times uh, you don't leave the funds on the table. You'll take them out at the end of the day. Um, so you're not, uh, so you don't have uh, overnight or event-based risk. Event-based risk would be Something like the Chinese saying, hey, we're going to shut down the exchanges. You, you would have your funds potentially you know, back in into dollars or into a, a token that has more of a fixed value, like Tether. Uh, technical trading. Uh, this is not my uh, area of expertise, uh, but I'm familiar with it. So Elliott waves, uh, kind of relate, uh, related on kind of a fractal pattern. Uh, looking at moving averages, uh, the technical lines that go, you know, you get 50-day moving averages, 200-day moving averages. There's a lot of people that do technical trading when things cross through these averages. Uh, they, they make predictions about that it will continue down to this average in, in these lines. Um, so there's different moving averages. Uh, resistance and support levels. Um, all of this stuff exists and has, has existed a lot for a long time. I think that, that it will move a certain way because of that shape. Uh, another one is uh, bot trading. For those of you who are programmers, uh, one of the nice things about uh, these exchanges is 
every one of them is API enabled. You can trade, uh, you can write a program and trade, uh, you can write it in just about any language, uh, Python, PHP, Java, you can connect to it, uh, connect to these uh, trading venues and trade directly. You can ask for the order book, you can ask for the bids, asks, uh, you know, the last price, uh, histories, uh, and uh, the other nice thing is there's a similar, not identical, but a similar API between the venues. Uh, so if you're familiar with one, uh, the rest of them kind of fall into place. They have a certain pattern of sending a nonce and signing the transaction that's being sent and whatnot. Um, so if you, if you do want to do this, you can sign up with the trading venue, go in uh, and say you want an API key. It will usually give you two values, an API key and a secret. The API key gets sent with your, with your transaction to kind of identify that it's your account and the secret never leaves. It's used to, to sign your trade or sign your instructions uh, to, the, to the trading venue. Um, so there's different, different strategies uh, to do bot trading. Uh, you can also go, for those who are, who are not as technical but still want to do this, there are bots out there that are uh, kind of, you know, with interfaces, front ends that you can, you know, click and use a strategy. Uh, these are some of, the st some of the strategies you can use. You can do the technical trading. You can have it automatically trade for you when it crosses these moving averages. Uh, you can do more of a high-speed trading, a ping-pong strategy, so it drops a little bit and you buy and then you place it on the other side of the order book and hope people will buy it and then pick it up and just kind of bounce back and forth and make just a little bit. Um, I think this was popular in China before they added the trading fees, and, and so they had extremely high volumes of trading uh, until the, uh, the Chinese government uh, stopped them and, and, and put a, a small trade, required them to put a small trading fee on it. Um, uh, arbitrage, this is another strategy. So between the various trading venues, there will be price differences. I'll give you an example that's happening right now. In China, the price of Bitcoin in Chinese yuan, but Chinese yuan converted to dollars, uh, is, is uh, lower than it is in the US. So it's about $2,800 to buy a Bitcoin off of a Chinese exchange right now. You can sell that same Bitcoin on a US exchange for somewhere in the 3150 range, although as fast as it's moving, my data may be out of date. I only looked at about 15 minutes ago. Um, so, but you can look for these differences. You can uh, set up a program that will for in this case, buy from a Chinese exchange, buy it for less, sell it on the US exchange and make that difference or the spread. Um, you can also arbitrage uh, through a route. So an example would be um, like Bitcoin and Dash might be trading on one venue, but you can find on another venue that it's cheaper if you go from Bitcoin to Litecoin to Dash and you can actually have the computer make that trade for you and then move it over to the other venue and sell it uh, and make money that way. Uh, lending. So uh, I like this one, uh, partly because I'm a buy and hold kind of person. Um, so I don't do a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, you know, trade, it, you know, like high speed trading or any of that. Uh, I do buy and, and hold. Uh, but so Bitfinex and, and Polynex are, are uh, two of the sites. There's a couple of others that allow for lending. This is like you own the coins and you're going to lend. Why would you lend it? You lend it to people who want to short it, and they want to short it, they, they borrow it from you at an interest rate, uh, a daily interest rate, and you lend it to them. They sell that right into the market right away, and they get the funds. They hope that, that the, whatever they borrowed, let's say Bitcoin, goes down, then they buy it cheaper, return the, the Bitcoin to you, and they keep the difference. Um, it's actually, uh, as long as it's not naked short selling, it, short selling is actually a good thing for the market. It lets people make money kind of both on the buy side and the sell side. Um, so one of the things though with lending is you feel like, well, wait a minute, what if they run off with it? Well, the sites are protecting you. So the lending rates are per day. The lending times, you decide what you want to, how long you want to lend it. If you say 30 days and someone borrows it from you, they have 30 days that it's kind of locked up. So if you said, oh no, Bitcoin's going down, I want to sell it, you couldn't, you, you've lent it out for the 30 days. But that's kind of the extent of your risk, that and potentially the site that, that's, that's protecting you, Bitfinex or Polo, going out of existence, just uh, counterparty risk. Um, but you get, to, uh, you get to earn the interest, uh, the site, uh, in this case, Bitfinex, uh, keeps 15% of your interest earnings. Uh, you can calculate your annualized interest rate. If you go in there and, and look at the daily interest rate, you can just multiply it by 365, 
multiply it by 0.85 to kind of factor in that they're taking 15% and you'll see what your annual interest rate. I have seen times where, uh, where you're loaning it out for several days, uh, that kind of thing, but the annualized interest rate had you lent it out for the entire time is in the multiple hundreds of percent, meaning you, would, you, know, you could double your money if you were lending it out the whole time. Uh, it's usually only let that way for a few weeks or something like that when uh, there's a reason for it. Either Bitcoin's going way up, people want to borrow dollars. If Bitcoin looks like Bitcoin's really high and people want to short it, they think it's going to go down, they'll pay a high interest rate for it during those times. Um, so it's very common uh, to find a 50% or better annualized rate on various coins. Uh, and again, you're pretty safe as long as the site doesn't go south on you. Um, so this is the reason that people borrow when they think the price is too high, they sell, wait for a drop, and then they buy it back and return the crypto to you. Uh, borrowing. So if you're feeling smart, adventurous, invincible, or clairvoyant, borrowing's for you. Uh, this is not something that, that I do. Uh, I think it's very risky. Um, basically, you're, you, can, uh, you can borrow dollars and buy Bitcoin. Uh, you're paying interest uh, on that. Um, you can also uh, do what th the other side of that lending, which is you can borrow Bitcoin, sell it, hope it goes down, and then return the Bitcoin. The danger is, of course, Bitcoin's extraordinarily volatile. It can take off and go the other way. When you buy and hold Bitcoin, you have limited exposure. That limited exposure may be that Bitcoin goes to zero and you lost everything, but that's the limit of your exposure. Uh, not so much when, when you're doing the, the borrowing. You, you, the limit of your exposure is whatever you have in your margin account. And so uh, you could have a lot in there to kind of protect you from having it forced sold on you. But if, uh, if, it, if Bitcoin takes off, they'll force sell it on you uh, and you can, it can wipe out your entire margin account. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's an option. Uh, it's very risky. Um, if the price runs up, you have to have enough funds in your account to cover the potential losses. Otherwise, You've borrowed it, you've sold the Bitcoin, and now you have to have enough funds such that the site feels protected and is able to give the funds back to the lender. If, however, Bitcoin goes way up and it looks at the numbers in your margin account and says, hey, this, this person doesn't have enough to cover this if it goes up anymore, they'll just basically take all, wipe out your entire margin account and return the Bitcoin to the lender. That's why the lender is protected. So crypto trading venues, uh, there's hundreds of them. Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with these. Uh, so I'll run through, through this uh, small set very quick. Um, Polo uh, has lots of medium-sized altcoins. Uh, Bitfinex, uh, it has lending and margin, which we just talked about, that's lend lending and, and borrowing. Um, it was hacked last year for about $60 million. Uh, but uh, incredibly, they, they issued for, for that entire 60 million, they issued a token, a dollar, a token that was worth a dollar to everybody who had funds, whether they, it was hacked for Bitcoin, but they basically socialized the, the losses across everybody, no matter what they had, Bitcoin, Litecoin, dollars, and, and they just chopped everybody down, I think 30 some odd percent, gave everybody a dollar token for every dollar they lost and said, we'll pay you back this a dollar for, for every token that you have. And uh, so people were like, yeah, they're probably not gonna survive this. Uh, but they did, they survived it, they paid them all back. And even in the interim, they, they created a market for that token. So people who didn't think they were gonna survive could buy those tokens at one point for like 40 cents on the dollar and they could buy it from other people or they could sell theirs and say, I just want the 40 cents. Say, I don't think you guys are gonna be able to pay this back. And, and so they, uh, and then eventually that token, as they were paying it back, started climbing towards a dollar. And uh, eventually you could sell them near a dollar or, or uh, then they paid, they paid everything back. Um, Bittrex has a lot of the smaller altcoins. Um, GDAX, GDAX is tied to Coinbase. Uh, I assume most of you are familiar with Coinbase. If not, probably the easiest, fastest way to get Bitcoin. If you wanna buy Bitcoin, go to Coinbase, link a bank account or use a debit card. Um, they support uh, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and now Litecoin. Uh, it's probably one of the safer ones. It's regulated uh, in times of extreme pressure. Lots of people buying Bitcoin. They have some kind of technical difficulties. But um, 
Gemini is another good one. That's the Winklevoss twins of, uh, if you've anybody seen the Facebook movie, the Facebook fame, uh, these guys got a, a settlement from Facebook. I got a bunch of money. They, they sunk it in Bitcoin. At one point they had, uh, and may still have, uh, like 1% of like all the Bitcoin. They had a lot. Uh, so they created this exchange. Um, they created it because they were going to do an ETF, an exchange traded fund. Uh, they didn't get that approved yet through the SEC. Hopefully that'll get approved eventually. Um, but it's, it's a good uh, trading venue. Uh, Kraken, uh, pretty safe, been around a long time, very trusted, terrible UI, just uh, kind of a terrible UI. Uh, BTCE, I updated this slide today because uh, it said BTC has been around a long time, kind of sketchy origins, you kind of like, eh, it's kind of Russian, kind of Belarus, you, know, you kind of didn't know where they were from. Uh, and I had very reliable so far. Uh, the U.S. government arrested one of the people they claim was one of their employees and, and did a $110 million fine and took their, their domain. Uh, this happened um, uh, late July 2017, so just a couple, a couple months ago. Um, they are back online, uh, but they are not trading yet, but they're back online uh, almost, uh, I think, in the face of the, the government. Kind of, they, they got a different domain, and they're, they're up, and you can log in, and you can see your balance. You just can't trade, deposit. Uh, uh, Liqui, uh, this is an, uh, one that has some of the smaller, kind of early tokens. Um, one, of the, one of the trading strategies that I've seen used is is uh, Liqui will have one of these, uh, have a token on there, and you'll trade and buy it for, while it's on there, and then hopefully that token gets added to one of the bigger exchanges, uh, to, to, to Bittrex or, or Polo. When that happens, a lot more people know about it and will buy it, and, it's kinda, and then you sell at that point. So it's kind one of the, one of the trading strategies out there. Uh, so choosing a token. Um, so if you haven't seen it already, uh, coin market cap. Is, is a great place to go. Uh, it lists about a thousand different tokens. Yes? Uh, I noticed you have Coinbase or Bitstamp token. That is true. I will talk about both of those. Um, uh, Coinbase is tied to GDAC, so it, uh, Coinbase isn't, is kind of a place to buy, but isn't really a trading venue as much, but, it, but it's definitely the place to buy. Uh, and Bitstamp is another one and probably should have been up there. Yep, definitely. Um, so these, these two uh, places are, are informational sites, CoinMarketCap and CoinGecko. Uh, there's a lot more, a lot more of them, uh, you know, informational sites, but these two are pretty good. CoinMarketCap has about 1,000 different coins. Uh, if you click on the price of a coin on CoinMarketCap, it'll show you what the current price is. You click on that, it'll take you all the markets that it's selling at. And you can look at that list and it'll tell you what the volume of trading is. And so if you want to trade or sell or buy something, one good way to do is just go on CoinMarketCap, do a search for that coin, click on the price, you'll see the list of where it's trading, you'll pick one of the higher, one, higher volume ones. Uh, if you go to that site and it's in Chinese and you can't read Chinese, then go to the next highest one. Uh, CoinGecko, uh, very, very similar. They just do a little bit different kind of analysis on the coins and sort them in a little bit different direction. Um, uh, for new ICOs, so this is about uh, ICOs and, and initial coin offerings. So how do you find out about them? Coins that have not been issued yet, coins that will be issued, coins that have, this, have potential that you want to study and find out if they're worth buying. Uh, so this is two good sites, uh, Smith & Crown is one and ICO rating. Uh, so they will list a lot of the ICOs. They'll list uh, information about the, uh, well, they, they actually pick some of the, uh, some of the coins. Uh, they ask that, they actually on their site, they say, you know, we don't want to be the one kind of like saying this is the, picking the winners and loser, losers, but they will pick ones that they think are interesting or that they've had a lot of questions about, and they will actually fly out meet the developers, talk to them, uh, do some research and things like that. Um, they, they do say on their site, don't take this as, as a vetting or, or an, uh, a, uh, I guess, stamp of approval, but they will actually go and talk to the developers of some of the more interesting ICOs and buying them. A lot of them are very, very profitable, uh, but you want to avoid the scam coins. If you can just avoid the scam coins and pick ones that are decent, you probably make money on this. Uh, so some of the questions to ask, uh, about these are what are they promising? Uh, how long have they been working at it? 
Uh, do they have a track record of success? Some of the some of these developers have been you know on multiple projects. Um, do they have a track record of scams? There's some that are actually serial scammers. There's just not. A, there's so much information about there, and so it's needle in the haystack to find out that these guys had already scammed people. Um, that information is out there, but but you know it's just they're not the ones publishing it. So you, you have to kind of dig to find that out. Um, do they have developers? Um, who's vouching for them, and what is the reputation? Um, I put this in here, but you do need to be careful on this. Uh, some of the some of the coins have put advisors, and if they even talk to one of these people, uh, they'll put them on as an, as an advisor. It doesn't mean that the advisor is, is actually vouching for them in any way. They just happen to, to have talked to them about that. So you need to be a little bit careful on that. Um, is it a new and novel idea? Or are they a copycat, fork, or clone? Um, so because of all of this is all open source, it's fairly easy to take uh, an existing idea uh, with the code and fork it and, and then make a, you know, give it a new name and sell it again. <laughs> so um, the, the, one that, uh, the one that typically has the, the ideas, the design, the developers, probably worth more. Not necessarily, but probably. Um, and then how much work have they done? Uh, is this just writing a white paper and then asking for money to develop this project? Or did they develop the project and now they're saying, hey, please, you know, work, please use, you know, invest in this ICO and use this token to kind of operate the, you know, what, what we've created. Um, since, uh, since I gave this presentation the first time, the SEC has come out and given some guidelines, at least in the US. Uh, there are some rules about uh, the SEC claims to have jurisdiction over uh, these projects and ICOs provided that they, um, if they are selling the token to be able to create the project, they consider an equity uh, to be outside of kind of the equity space, uh, then and to not be you know subject to the to the SEC rules, uh, they need to be. It needs to be a token, more like a Chuck E. Cheese token, something that operates the machinery that they've built uh, and part of their protocol. Um, and the other thing to look for is, is it open source? Uh, if it's not open source, you probably, probably don't want to touch it. It's uh, um, almost all of these things, because they're holding value, you want to be able to see the code and at least know that some people have the ability to read and see what's going on, even if, even if you yourself don't. Um, valuing coins. This, this one's probably one of the more interesting ones. Um, so I was at, on a, at a... Uh, a Bitcoin conference uh, and met the authors of this book uh, from Jack Tartar and, and, and Chris Berniski. Uh, they've written a book called Crypto Assets. Uh, and it, it's, the book is about how to value these, these tokens. And the reason, reason this is important is uh, if you're in, let's say, evaluating a stock, for example, a stock, uh, you, you own a, part, a portion of the company. Uh, you have uh, in bankruptcy, you have certain rights. Uh, you can get dividends. Uh, they have a book value, a bank account, maybe some assets that they purchased that have been appreciated or depre depreciated. Um, they have a price earnings ratio. They have a, a potential to earn more in the future, and you can project that, um, project those earning flows and make these calculations to say, what is this company worth? Uh, that doesn't exist in most of these tokens. Uh, these tokens. Uh, they don't have uh, assets. I mean, they are the asset. Um, so they need a new way of, of, uh, of valuing these tokens. And so these guys came out with a, a number of different things. I probably haven't, haven't uh, covered all of them here. Uh, but these are some of them that they're looking at. So uh, like a fax machine, the token, you can create it. You, you yourself can go and create tokens and say, oh, I now have a billion Tron tokens. But they're not worth anything. I'm the only one that have them. I just created them, and it took a couple of keystrokes. Um, so what makes them valuable? And, and these are some of the things. So like a fax machine, uh, one fax machine isn't really worth anything. It's kind of the network effect. Once everyone has one, it's worth something. For those of you who don't know what a fax machine is, I apologize. <laughs> I'm old. Uh, so the um, number of users uh, uh, is one. Uh, daily trade volume in, in dollars. So this is a really good one. Uh, you can look at the trade volume. And if you go look at the trade volume of, say, uh, Bitcoin versus Litecoin, you can just see the growth over time. Uh, and you know, Bitcoin has more users, more trade volume, uh, the number of nodes, the number of people running the software, uh, the number of developers. Uh, 
the, the active commits or events on GitHub. This is something that, that the, the uh, Chris works for ARK Investments. And that's one of the things they look at. They, they actually go to the GitHub and they look at a uh, number of commits, number of events, and kind of see the activity on the site and use that as part of one of the metrics to say what is, what is this token worth. Um, their goal is to, is, to say, is to find tokens that are undervalued based on their metrics and then be able to invest in those and hopefully they'll catch up with, with uh, you know, what their metrics are showing. Um, the number and, and size of the trading venues. So a, a token that's traded in one small venue uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't have the liquidity. Uh, when, when it comes time to sell it, there's a good chance that you go to that venue, something could happen to the venue, or there's low volume, and as you sell it, the price will go down, or as you buy it, the price goes up. For a token like Bitcoin, there's now $2 billion a day just cycling around. So if you want to sell a million dollars of Bitcoin, you can shove it into that flow and it really won't affect it much. Um, but for some other coins, you try to sell a million dollars worth, it's going to take you a while. Uh, so uh, the number of miners, um, the difficulty of mining. So the difficulty of mining tends to, tends to change the, the, the value of the coin. Uh, it's been a really interesting experiment uh, with, with Bitcoin. Each time there's a halving, there's, a, there's all these predictions of, of, of Bitcoin going down or not, not surviving it because the miners aren't going to make enough now that they're only getting half as much. And what's happened, at least so far, no guarantees, but as it gets close to that halvening date, uh, it's, it's, uh, the value has gone up to kind of almost even out and make that match. So it's, it's been really interesting. Um, the market cap, uh, you know, that, uh, maybe that's a, that's a bad one because we're actually talking how to value it. The market cap is the value. It's the number of issued tokens times the current price of the token. Um, whether it's pre-mined or issued versus mined into existence. So mined into existence would be Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dash. Uh, pre-mined uh, would be um, uh, Civic or uh, Bcap or, or one of these ICO tokens where it just exists. They just sell it into existence. That's what an ICO is. They've got all the tokens. They just sell them. Um, and then also the, the thing to watch uh, for is the inflation rate for mined coins. So the inflation rate is the rate at which these coins are going to be continuously issued. Um, so at the beginning, uh, I'll give you an example, Zcash right now. Zcash has a similar issuance schedule as uh, Bitcoin, but it's early on in its cycle. So there's still a lot of Zcash to be issued. So it's as if uh, Bitcoin was, was in the very first year, Zcash is kind of in that first year. Um, and so there's you know, only maybe you know, 10, 15, 20% have been issued of that particular token. Um, so it has another kind of 80% you know, or at least another 50% coming out in the next six years. So you need to watch kind of that inflation rate because those are coins that are coming into existence that will be sold by miners and, and will push the price down. So as, if there's not enough buyers to kind of keep that price up, uh, that's going to affect the price. Um, so yeah, how many, how many are still to be mined and at what rate? Um, another one that's interesting, I don't know if you're familiar with EOS. EOS is a really interesting coin. Uh, it has, uh, it's the same guy who did uh, Steam, Steamit, um, and BitShares, uh, Daniel Larimer. Really interesting coin, but they're selling 2 million tokens a day for almost the next year. And so the price uh, will likely go down because they're going to be issuing a billion or something coins uh, over the next year. So... Um, that, that, that would be a, an example of the ICO sale, but also uh, looking at the inflation rate over time. Uh, so these are more concrete uh, steps to trade. If you haven't traded, uh, these are kind of, this, this is the recipe. Um, so start by going to uh, getting Bitcoin from Coinbase, Gemini, or Gladera. Gladera is kind of linked up with uh, iOS bread wallet, so that's for iPhone users. Um, sign up for one or many of the trading sites. I would probably start with uh, Poloniex or Bittrex, one of those. Um, uh, this is more of a security thing. Use a strong password, add two-factor authentication to the site. Um, that's, it's not going to protect you from the site going away or being hacked in general uh, and potentially disappearing one day, but it will help protect your account uh, from being hacked. Uh, so you'd find the wallet or account page uh, on the site. Uh, hit deposit and send your Bitcoin from Coinbase, Gemini, or from Bread Wallet, uh, from whatever wallet you have your Bitcoin in, send it over to the site. Find the coin you want to buy. Uh, it usually will be for sale against Bitcoin. 
Um, there's other ones that sometimes only sell for against Litecoin, but that's for the ones that have very, very, very small price. Uh, you can, uh, so you can buy the coin that's on the order book by placing a bid at a higher, uh, at or higher than the asks. So on the order book, uh, and I apologize for the people that know all this stuff and it's just a repeat, but there's an order book. So a bunch of people buying and a bunch of people uh, selling, uh, and you can just uh, sell uh, to someone who's buy or buy from someone who's who's selling theirs at the, at that price, and it's okay uh, because of the way the sites work to bid a little bit more than what's there. What'll happen is you'll get the one that you see on the order book. You'll get that price. Uh, the other option uh, you can do is uh, set the price that you're willing to to buy at, and it will put it on the order book somewhere. And you can wait for the, the order book to change. You may never get it at that price. The price can just continue to go up. Or you can have a day like today and the price drops down and you pick up that, you pick up that order. So you, you can set them there and just wait for a dip and it'll pick it up. And it can just sit on the order book even after you log out. So you don't have to sit there and wait and watch it. You can just set your order. Say, I'm willing to pay this much, 10 cents, no more. And you can set that price. And it, it'll just sit there and wait until it hits 10 cents. Um, so there have been some people who have picked up real bargains. There have been sites where, where there's a, a fat finger order or something goes wrong and the, the price just plummets and picks up uh, you know, and, and sells a lot. And so people have gotten coins cheap just by having their, some orders in there really cheap. Um, so that's an, you know, probably not a, it doesn't happen often, often, but it has happened. Uh, you do have uh, some risk. Once you've traded, uh, once you've made the trade, you'll have the coin and you can hit withdraw and send it to your own wallet uh, offline. You can leave it on the site, but there is some risk uh, on the site uh, that the site goes away. Uh, this has happened. Um, a lot of you have been in the space a long time. Uh, it's happened to Mt. Gox, happened to Cripsy, it's happened to BTCE. Um, these are all sites that have just kind of disappeared in kind of one day, gone. Uh, so. Uh, and yeah, so uh, because of that, I would recommend uh, that you move it to your own system, uh, but then you're responsible for holding on to your private key. Um, you can do that a number of different ways. There's hardware wallets, there's paper wallets, uh, multiple backups, uh, but you want to make sure you don't lose it. There is no, uh, once it's kind of on your wallet and you have the private key, there is nobody that you can call and say, I lost my password or whatever. You are responsible for that. So. Um, so there's risk in that as well. Uh, so there's a saying in crypto, you hold the private keys, your coin. You don't hold the private keys, not your coin. And that's because when it's on an exchange, they hold the private keys to that token. Um, if they go away, there's a chance you're not getting it back. Uh, so this is a different method of trading, uh, trading stealth. Um, so you can trade without providing identifying information. So a lot of these other sites have been mandated that they have to collect information, KYC, AML, uh, it's anti-money laundering laws. Uh, KYC, KYC stands for know your customer. These are banking laws. Uh, the trading venues uh, increasingly are required to, to ask for this information. Some do, some don't. Some are outside the US. Some don't deal with, uh, with uh, euros, dollars, et cetera, that connect to the regular financial system. And so some of them are outside of this requirement but a lot of them are asking for this information. Um, if you prefer not to provide that information, there are some options. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, so you can get Bitcoin from someone on local Bitcoins and pay cash. So you meet somebody in a dark alley or at a coffee shop, trade Bitcoin for cash, uh, and go to lo local Bitcoins to look people up to, 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 uh, to find out um, you know, where someone is near you. Um, and, this, and that's worldwide. Uh, local Bitcoins uh, is all over the place. Uh, store the new Bitcoin in an address that's never been used, so I'm not on, on an exchange, so you can store that on, on something where, where you hold the private key. Then you choose the coin you want from shapeshift.io. So shapeshift.io is, is uh, uh, the company is in Switzerland, and you send uh, the Bitcoin, say what, what uh, you choose what coin you want, you send the amount of Bitcoin you want to trade for the other coin, they tell you what the rate is going to be, it's a pretty decent rate. It's very comparable to what you could get on the trading engines. They basically connect to all the various different trading venues and build a consolidated order book and then give you a rate uh, based on kind of how far they have to go down into that order book. Uh, it's a pretty fair deal. Um, I've done some analysis of, of their rates and it's, it's pretty fair. You choose your coin, send the Bitcoin, the other coin shows up. 
Uh, so you give them the address of where you want the other coin deposited and it's sent to you. Um, and you can even store that on a, on a paper wallet. So you can, you can print out a paper wallet, which has never been online, and get the address off that, give that to Shapeshift, and they'll send it to there. The, that, that token is now stored, obviously, on the blockchain, but the, the reference to it or the information, your address and key are, have only ever been on, been on paper, uh, never on a computer. Uh, so you can use Shapeshift to trade from, any, from Bitcoin to any coin. Uh, that's uh, basically covered that already. Uh, and then you wait for the new coin to show up in, in the wallet address. Um, these are, uh, so Shapeshift, Changely, and Evercoin are very similar. Uh, Changely does ask for email addresses, and I'm not sure about Evercoin. Uh, but Shapeshift, you don't need to provide your name, your, your social security number, your email. Just send Bitcoin and tell them what coin you want, and they'll, they'll swap it out for you. Uh, risks. So some of the risks you have in doing this, uh, risks of website hacks are fraud. Uh, Mount Gox and, and Cripsy are two examples. BTCE is a recent example. Um, so far, you can't withdraw the funds. They're, they're there and you can see that you had them, but you can't withdraw them. So I'm not sure exactly what's gonna happen with that. Uh, so the risk of your own poor decision-making skills, you know, it's like, ah, it's going up, I gotta buy, and then you know, kind of buying at the top, so that, that type of risk. Uh, risk of not protecting your own private keys and being hacked. So you can, on your computer, you could have your keys, uh, your addresses uh, and your coins stored there and someone can come in, a virus or something else, uh, and, and basically find those and, and, and take the private keys and, and sweep your funds and then you don't have them anymore. Um, risk of losing your private keys. Private keys are, are kind of notoriously difficult to, to uh, store. Every copy you store of them is one more kind of entry point that someone could find them and get them. Right? So even though you have your copy, and yet you don't want to lose it, so you want to have backup copies. So you got to be kind of find that balance between storing private keys and storing too many copies of the private keys where someone else can find them. Um, uh, risk of uh, price drops, so just buying high and, and having to sell low or having it, you know, buying it at the top of the market, that's a risk. And then the risk of making lots of money and just becoming a jerk. So uh, moving coin to your control. So uh, this is once you've traded and you and you uh, so you've you've taken your Bitcoin, you've traded it for another coin. Um, let's say uh, Dash, for example. Uh, but you don't want to store the Dash on the exchange. Uh, so you would download the reference software for the coin. Um, the, the, the exception to this is, a, is Ethereum. For Ethereum, you basically use something, uh, something else. But for a lot of the other coins, they have software that you download. You download that, uh, you add a strong uh, passphrase to it immediately. So the first thing you do is add a, a strong password. Uh, then you, then you uh, if it's in the, you have a UI for it, a user interface, you say, give me a new address. It'll give you an address to pay. Uh, or if it's a command line one, so some of them are, are uh, just a command line version. Uh, you call get new address, and it'll give you an address, and then you transfer, you go to the exchange and you say send my funds from the exchange to this address. And now you have a file on your computer, usually called wallet.dat. It's protected by a strong password, which you don't want to lose because there's nobody to give you that password back. Um, and you need to keep that safe. I mean, you can back it up on disk, keep your password safe. Um, you, if you get hacked, as long as they don't know your password, they could probably steal your wallet.dat. If your password's strong enough, you'll be okay. But you transfer the funds to the ad at that address, keep track of your file, keep track of your password, um, and, and then just back everything up uh, to multiple places. Um, and then it's in your control and you're in charge of it and it'll just, the, the coins are not stored in that file. What's, what's stored in that file is your ability to spend those coins. So the coins are actually stored on the blockchain, whatever blockchain that is, uh, but your ability to spend them is is contained in that wallet file and, and uh, protected by the password that you've chosen. So, which tokens? <laughs> I get this question a lot. Uh, people want to know what to buy. Uh, so, I I hesitate to give people actual like advice to buy specific ones, simply because I don't know the future. Uh, but I can kind of break them down into, into groups. Uh, so less risk and less, but less reward would be Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum Classic, Litecoin, and Dash. 
Uh, the reason those are less risk and less reward is they're just bigger markets. They're more stable coins. Uh, they're a little safer that way. Um, uh, and they, they just don't move as much as some of the smaller ones, although everything moved quite a bit today. Uh, moderate risk reward. So if you go to coinmarketcap.com, the same site I talked about earlier, uh, the top 100. So the top 100, I call it above the fold, right? They're all on the front page. So that would be, uh, they're all pretty big uh, because mark, coin market cap sorts by the actual market cap, uh, meaning the, if you multiplied the price by how many there are, that, that number, they're sorted by that number. So Bitcoin obviously at the top and then going down from there. Um, there's about 1,000 coins, but the first 100 will give you moderate risk of reward. Uh, if you want to go high risk, high reward, pick ICOs from Smith & Crown. Go find ones that look like they'll be, that, that have a future uh, and buy it at the price that they're initially offering at. And then when it goes on the market and everybody else finds out about it, you know, that now that it's on a trading venue that people frequent, uh, the price a lot of times go up. So um, that's a, another option. Or pick coins 100 to 800 on coin market cap. They're smaller, they, have, uh, they just don't have as much market cap. Uh, but you need to understand what you're buying. I mean, uh, one of the nice things about, um, uh, about coin market cap is you can go on there, click on a coin, and then click on website, and it'll take you to the website. If you haven't done, this is actually a good way to get to the website of a coin rather than typing it in, in uh, Google. One of the things that's happening now is you type something in Google, the first one that comes up is an ad. The ad's paid for by a scammer. You figure, ah, somebody's paying for it, it's the top one, click. And they, they make the domain just a little bit off, and they're basically taking you to a scam site. Um, you download the software you know, for that coin or something, and the coin goes and looks for wallet.dat or looks on your computer for other things, tries to, tries to steal tokens from you. So you just do need to be careful, but one of the, one of the good ways to, to find the site for a coin, go to CoinMarketCap, look for the coin, click on the coin, and then click on website. It'll take you to the correct website for that coin. Uh, you want super high risk uh, and reward. Uh, pick and choose from the top 1,000 coins and, and speculate. There's, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of reward out there if you pick the right ones, but you know, there's a lot of risk if you pick the wrong ones. Uh, in summary, uh, be careful, have fun, become wealthy, and don't be a jerk. Any questions? Yeah. What's the typical uh, percent return on, say, the top, uh, I'll say, 10 ICOs? Okay. And then in the first year, we were getting that in. I've seen upwards of 7,000 percent. I've seen a bunch of different. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been, there's been a bunch that have been 7,000 percent easily. Right? That's 70x. Yeah. There, there have been ones like that. Uh, with the frenzy happening, what ends up happening is the price on the ICO ends up being a little bit higher because so many people are trying to get into the ICOs that once it hits the market, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily go up. So I think that maybe the early ones, you know, when you're talking the Ethereum and things like that, was like 100,000% or something to date. At least it was as of two days ago. Uh, it's gone down now a little bit, but um, still pretty good return. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have the specific numbers on, on uh, on a lot of, uh, the ones, the, I would say the more recent ones have not been as lucrative for return because so many people have just kind of like gone in and were buying the ICOs initially, right? And so the, they drove the price up early. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I believe that some activity has slowed down, uh, especially in the hesitant to really trade Bitcoin because they have Bitcoin cash that they haven't really covered. Uh, do you uh, know of what you think is a <coughs> and safe way to recover your Bitcoin cash? Uh, yeah, I've helped a lot of people recover their Bitcoin cash. It depends on where it is. Um, uh, mostly I was helping people get it out of Coinbase because Coinbase said they weren't going to honor it. Uh, they have since changed their minds. <laughs> Possibly because of the threat of lawsuits and whatnot. There's a lot of talk of that. Yeah. Um, what would you recommend as uh, simple, safe? Oh. Um, or is there one? 
No, the yeah, others. I, I think for the financial community, it's got to be simple. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the easy, easier ones is to find one of the wallets that lets you both uh, uh, I have to think about that. Uh, the, the ones I've been doing, I've been moving them to hardware wallets, so, and they've, they've been supporting it. Um, well, I, I think some people even have a better movie now yes. because they may invalidate one of uh, that Bitcoin cash. That is true. Least, I believe that's a percent. If you have the private key, uh, you will not invalidate it by sending the Bitcoin. Um, so, because the private key will still work for Bitcoin Cash. Um, if you have it on a, yeah, it varies from wallet to wallet. So, I think that's a real issue. I think that was simplified and, and explained as easy. I think, would, I think there's a pause right now. I, I agree. I think there's a pause for two reasons. I think there's a, there's an issue with uh, the potential for Bitcoin to do this similar type of thing in November again, because uh, there's still kind of some debate and discussion over the block size. Um, so that, that, there's a potential for that. Um, but uh, yeah. I just think it's a real issue. Yeah. If, any, if anyone needs help uh, moving Bitcoin Cash, let me know. I can, I can help them. Yes. I think one of the biggest concerns a lot of us have is you just keep making these all for one team out of the woodwork. Yeah. And it's devaluating the entire thing and making the whole thing look like a joke. Because there are just so many of them coming out uh, everywhere. And I'm just curious, is there, what, what, what kind of pushback is the community doing to try to create some sensibility into this? this uh, I call it a few songs. Yeah. I might, I, I would probably take exception to abuse. I, it's sort of an unregulated area where there's no boss, there's no, um, and I, I kind of like that character of it. I think there will be a, a time where there are uh, scams that, that cause people to slow down again, right? Because the, there's another scam that a bunch of people jumped into. Um, so I think that will help temper it. I think the, the, the China kind of stopping the ICOs is gonna temper it a little bit for a while. Um, but at the same time, the, the thing that excites me the most is, is the fact that I mean, this has the potential to, to disintermediate venture capital, right? People, if they have a great idea, then they can get it funded uh, through this. And, and it allows people that have not been able to invest uh, because of the, the stringent regulations of having to be an accredited investor. I know there were rules that were put in place back in 1934 to protect grandma from a, from a rogue uh, railroad you know, scam or something. Uh, and these same rules are in place now where everybody has access to tremendous amounts of information. The rules need to, need to be changed, I think, in my opinion. But, yeah. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I have that debate with, uh, with people here, actually. Um, I guess it, you almost have to define, you know, what is, what is a bubble? I mean, it, it's, if you, I mean, if you classify the original investment in, you know, like the, in, the, in the internet in the 90s as a bubble, then it kind of is. I mean, it's kind of an up and down, uh, and but it's funding things that should be funded, funding things that shouldn't be funded, and when it we call it popped uh, in you know kind of 2000 time frame, uh, it took good companies, Amazon and those companies with it, uh, but you know things like Pets.com that probably shouldn't have existed, uh, you know needed to go and then other ones uh, were buying opportunities uh, for, for things like Amazon that had, you know, a, a, you know, a, a real future. So, yes? What uh, I, ICOs have you seen work that don't have their own blockchain technology that just use like a basic ERC-20 token? Oh, most, I think. Uh, lot, like lots and lots. Really yeah, there there have been lots that, that that they have a reason for the token. Uh, the token is is there for um, 
you know, for doing micro lending or for doing, uh, you know, for raising funds for something. Um, and, and so their business model isn't necessarily the, you know, driving something on the blockchain. Um, it isn't the, the, you know, like a storage or something where it's, you know, where that token is operating, but it is helping to fund uh, kind of something that, that, that will have both a source and a sink, uh, but the token didn't need to be uh, issued over time. <coughs> don't like uh, ICOs like that. Like you, yeah, for example, I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for him, but I've seen people like Naval tweet, you know, that, that they just don't mess with, not that they don't mess with them, but you know, that they, they put their attention into ICOs like Filecoin right. or, right. you know, stuff like that. Whereas something like, I don't know, Civic is probably one of the best examples I can think of that just using, you know, simple ERC-20 but doesn't have yep. awesome, you know, infrastructure technology. Right. Um, what are your thoughts on that and what that does to the whole ecosystem? Um, I, I like the idea that, that, that somebody who has a fantastic idea can raise funds to do that idea and that everybody looks at it, evaluates it on, on, on its merits, on the people who are behind it, and do their own, their own research and put their own money at risk. I think it's their money, and if they want to invest and fund something, it is opening up an opportunity, I think, for individuals who really haven't been able to invest in things like Uber or Lyft and see those opportunities, it now gives people that possibility. Um, it's, it's still open in Europe. It's clamped down a little bit here in the US. Uh, they're setting some rules, but it's gonna, it's gonna spur innovation. And if those rules continue to exist, uh, it's gonna hurt the US kind of you know, globally. And there are some, some uh, things because of the Jobs Act and, and uh, uh, some other things that, that allow smaller uh, fundraising type things to still happen. So that's good, but, but yeah. Um, not very up to speed on all the ICOs, but in general, is it the case that to be an ICO, it's, the coin is already mined, and that's why they're initially, off, initially offering it to the public as a coin that's already been mined? Or is there such thing as uh, a, a coin that's ICOing but is being mined. Like you mine it. Yeah. Or is it the case that most, that most or all, by definition, ICOs are pre mined? I would say the term ICO is intended for the coins that are just just in existence already and then they're selling them. So the, that's where the, you know, so the initial coin offering, we're offering it for this much. For the, for the ones that are like, you know, Litecoin and things like that, you know, there's probably another term. I don't like altcoin because it's a little bit derogatory, I think, but um, they, they just need a better term for that, I think. Yeah, so there's actually that Chris Berniski was, was really upset at the term ICO because he said it's going to be like IPO and the SEC is going to come crashing down on it. He said, call it anything else, a, you know, token launch, a token sale, a token something. You know, just give it a different name so it doesn't have that connotation. Yeah. So uh, the nice part is with, with the cryptocurrency, you can usually figure out whether that is the case um, on, the, on the ERC-20 contracts. What was uh, the question? Oh, so I'm sorry. The, the question is, so in, in NASDAQ, for example, uh, a company can go back and say, hey, our, our company's valued highly, or we need to raise more money, and they can just issue more shares, uh, you know, kind of devaluing, bringing in funds for that, but potentially devaluing or you have a smaller share of what hope you would hope if the, if the executives are you know, doing their job of a bigger pie now because they've sold additional shares. Uh, for a lot of these tokens uh, using the ERC-20 contract, you can read the contract. Uh, it's it's in, a, you know, in a programming language, and you can see that it's kind of a one-time issue, meaning as you create the contract, you tell it what the name of it is, what the, what the token name is, and the number of shares. And that, that initialization or, or uh, in, you know, kind of in the programming language, that constructor, it, it only gets called once. And so that's as many sh of those tokens as there will ever be. Um, so it does protect you, not, and not all of them. So I don't want to speak for like every token offering. You could certainly make one that, 
that issues you know, 2% every year to kind of handle inflation or do something like that. There are tokens out there that do those types of things. Uh, but the ones that are based around the ERC-20 contract, which is a lot of them, uh, that you know, it's a fixed issuance, right? This is, this is the amount, you know, it's a billion or a million or whatever it is. They decide up front. You know up front. Um, a lot of times the founders will keep some. Uh, they'll sell some. Um, they'll use some for advertising or development, things like that. But the, but the, the, number of is, the number issued is fixed. So, so for those that are, that are not available to those yeah. And that's a fairly recent thing. So it was, it was just a couple of months ago where they came out with this guidance. So uh, what's happening now is some of the ICOs kind of, whoa, whoa, and they kind of pulled their ICO back, you know, pulled it off of Smith & Crown, um, and they're rethinking it. Some of, our, some of them, there's some rules that you can issue up to like 99 uh, to 99 parties in the U.S. So they'll do all 99 parties in the U.S., but all of those have to be accredited investors, which means you have a, either like a $2 million income or, or a million dollars in, in, in assets, not including your primary residence. There's a bunch of rules, and they'll sell to them and then just go to the rest of the world. Uh, some of them are very, very protective on their website. They're like, uh, no, you got to send, because, of, because of they don't want to violate the SEC rules, they'll require like a passport, for example, scan of your passport for everybody because they need to know where you're from. Other ones are like, you know, please check here if you're not a US citizen or whatever. Um, those are a little lighter weight. You can, there's, yeah, anyway, I will, I'm on video. <laughs> <laughs> so to kind of take you back on this question, the limit of coins, how does that work in with like the fork? You get Bitcoin, you yeah. get forks off. Yeah. So what's the story with that? You just double the coins? You, you did double the coins. Um, so if you had, let's say, 100 Bitcoin, you now have 100 Bitcoin cash. Uh, this is true not of, uh, so there's a couple of different, there's two different kinds of coins. Like an ERC-20 is an Ethereum one. That it doesn't do that uh, type of thing. But with uh, Bitcoin or its derivatives, which would include Litecoin and others, uh, if there's a fork, uh, then you have, uh, you have coins, so the coins get spent into a block as an unspent, uh, an unspent output, uh, UTXO, and so those are in a block somewhere, you know, and the blocks are just being added, and so your unspent output is there. When it forks, you have coins that you can spend on the left side of the fork and coins you can spend on the right side of the fork, and as, as long as there's value uh, on both of those, uh, you can spend it on both. You can actually fork the, a coin yourself, though. I mean, you can go, you can go change the co code, run your own node, and fork a coin. And so now you have, you know, two 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 chains: one that goes left, you know, and a Bitcoin one, and then you know, Tron coin one that go. And, and, but it has no value because nobody honors it. This one was sort of a unique situation, in that there were enough people that were kind of upset with kind of what was going on. And the people who did Bitcoin Cash did a good job of picking a new symbol, a new name, a new brand. Uh, they, they, protect, they did replay protection. They did um, uh, uh, double spend protection. They did a bunch of things, uh, double spend protection built in, replay protection, wipeout protection. Um, and they did all of these, these things to kind of make it so that there was less confusion, that it was a very clean break. Uh, and it, so it's gained uh, a real value. And, and so it's... Uh, it's probably not going to happen often, but it could happen again in November. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a question I've seen with more and more ICOs, they're reserving amounts for airdrops. And I've seen airdrop exclusive uh, starts to point. So do you think airdrops will kind of reduce the 70x uh, increase on the you know the three days after a coin is, is initially sold? Or what, what, what role do you think airdrops would play? So uh, let, let me explain airdrops and, and you tell me if I, if I get this, this right. Um, so the airdrops that I'm thinking of are uh, if you have Bitcoin, you can sign a transaction or send a small amount and get a different coin. Is that the... So, so for example... Um, oh, man. Oh, so, yeah, so OMG did a, they had a percentage of their reserve tokens yeah. for airdrops. So everybody who had 0.1 uh, Ethereum in their wallets at, the t at what, July 7th, yes. uh, something like that, they, they received a portion to kind of stimulate the market. But for free. That, yeah, for free. Yes. But then you have, like on, on the Steemit blockchain, there's 
There's a token called Pocket, and there were 80, mil there were 80 billion reserves, but only like 1.3 billion claimed. So the other, or no, 8 billion claimed. So the other ones were burned, and that was a pure airdrop token. Yep. So I, I mean, I just. It's, it's becoming more and more of a thing with ICOs, and I'm wondering if it has a future in diluting the kind of the returns in, in return for stimulating the market. Yeah, I don't think I don't think it. I mean, my this is my opinion, just pure opinion here. I don't think it uh, dilutes returns. Um, I think there's an advantage. Uh, so one of the things that happened. I have I have some Bitcoin, and so there have been some airdrops where. Uh, you sign a transaction. Uh, I think Byteball is one. Clams is another. Um, if you have Bitcoin and you have the private keys and kind of the technical chops to sign a transaction, um, you can go get free Clam uh, and uh, Byteball. Uh, and then uh, there was another one recently. Uh, what's that? Stellar. Stellar. That, that's what it was. Yeah, Stellar Lumens. They'll give them give them away to anybody who signs transactions. Um, so it was kind of a pain pulling all the keys out and whatnot, but I signed transactions and I got a bunch of Stellar. Uh, and the advantage to the coin issuer is the value of your coin goes up the more people that have it. It's that number of users and number of transactions are kind of the two primary metrics. You know, a coin, I can issue a coin you know, out of thin air and if nobody's using it, it has no value. So it immediately gives uh, like a market or not a market, but, but users, you know, people say, Hey, I got free coin by doing this. And all of a sudden they get a larger user base. So I think it benefits everybody. Uh, it may, if there's any dilution, it's dilution because, uh, of maybe what you were talking about over here, which is, is that there's so many coins. It's just so overwhelming that, that you kind of get burnt out, if you will, of, and you just go, well, forget it, I'm going to stick with Litecoin, Bitcoin, Dash, or whatever, just stop, you know. So it may have dilution in that regard, uh, but I don't, th I, I think the more people use these, the, the better, and in my opinion, the more there are, the better, especially when you have things like um, Shapeshift, where you can move freely between them, it makes the, you know, when they talk about uh, having, like, true distributed, you know, they're worried about distributed mining and whatever, having the coins be so widely distributed, so many of them, that it becomes just a, you know, I mean, you try to stop it, you just have to give up. There's, it's, it's you know, the, the horse is out of the barn kind of thing. Yeah? <laughs> no, you don't give them your private keys. You use your private key to sign, uh, they, they give you a string to sign, and you use your private key to sign that string, and all it does is say, I own the address. They look at the address that of the, so if you sign something, they can find out what the address is, or you can give them the address uh, and, and they'll look at it, and then you just prove you own that address by signing something with, with the pri matching private key. So um, if you, if, yes. Yes. So for those of you who do own Bitcoins and you do have kind of the private key for it, whether it's in the private key is in, uh, you know, in a keep key or in a hardware wallet or paper wallet or wherever it is, uh, or even just in the, in the Bitcoin client, because it has the ability to sign, uh, there's at least three, uh, Clams, uh, Stellar, and I don't know if they're still doing that, but they may do it regularly, and Byteball. You can get free uh, just by going to their site and doing, basically proving that you own Bitcoin they'll give you free. So it's just free, free money. Well, I, I understand yes. Yep. And Ripple just gave it away. They were just like, come to our site, we'll give you 5,000 Ripple. For those that were mentioned that have done that already, like uh, OMG, for example, could I, having owned a lot of Ethereum, could I still go back and get my OMG for that? Or is that over? I don't know. So I do know that on Byteball, they're, they're doing it at certain uh, times. So November 4th is the next one for whatever reason they're doing it on the full moon. So I missed the last one. I think it was September 7th or something. They're doing it on November 4th. So you have to do it, I think, before, prove that you have it before then, and then they'll issue it. But I think I could have, had I been paying more attention, could have done it both for September 7th and then again for November 4th and again. So I think you just have to keep pulling the stuff out of your drawer and safe and signing these things. But I think you can continue to get more until, they're, until they've issued it all. Yeah. I'm pretty sure for the ERP20 token, it just goes straight to your wallet, your ERP20 yeah. wallet. So there's no, there's no because it's on that, um, that mid-lock, <coughs> that chain, then it automatically delivers to your wallet because it's all on the same network. It's all speaking the same way. Yeah. So if you if you were a holder on 
It's either the seventh or the seventh or the seventeenth. Right? Yeah, I'm like she's getting the best right now, but um, yeah. Mark, what was the date on that? Do you know? Uh, uh, July seventeenth was. The And, and can you still get it now? So, so you can still do it? Okay. Okay. Can you still prove that you had money at that point? Okay. Oh, okay. Got it. So if you don't see it... So if you don't see it in your wallet, do you just need to tell your wallet to add that token or something? No, what's interesting is the Keep Key wallet itself doesn't support ERC20 tokens. And my Keep Key, I hit for some, for a good reason, wiped it out. I am, I was looking on Etherscan.io and all of a sudden I had, um, oh, and a wallet that doesn't support that ERC20 token. Yet. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yes. Uh, I have two concerns about the future of uh, cryptocurrency as a whole with a government and the banking institutions. Yeah. I'm concerned about what's your opinion about how that's going to affect this. If the uh, market share of the crypto world, which is over 100 million now, yeah. is trillion, yeah. or 5 trillion, yeah. okay, it's going to be a lot of attention. Yeah, I'm with you. And I'm curious, this is my main concern yeah. about long term, is what the government's going to say. No, we can't have this currency because it's taking over the United States. Yeah. We can't have that happen. Yeah. It was designed to do that, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not going to stop. Stop the recording. <laughs> I'll stop it if you want. No, I'm just kidding. We appreciate it. This is a big um, that, Honestly, that's one of the reasons I'm here. Uh, that was. I knew that this was one of the places where the gears were going to grind as far as the legal. Um, and so Patrick Byrne went you know, straight down the legal line or whatever, making a, a, a token that would, you know, represented a share of, of overstock and, and released that on, on December 16th. Um, it was a challenge. We, we did, I mean, it was a lot of legal work uh, and things like that. It didn't turn out quite like it, it ended up having a lot of guardrails around it, uh, similar to you know, kind of what the existing system has. Um, so that was an interesting um, experiment to kind of see you know, what would happen. Uh, Bitcoin can't, can't really be shut down. Um, you're seeing right now today uh, what a government can do, which is there's, there's you know, tra uh, trading venues that have you know, buildings and people and, and things like that. And so uh, China, for whatever reason, I think it's a mistake on China's part. I think they had a lot to gain um, from not doing that. Uh, you know, they're, they're big in the mining and, and it really does help people. Um, you know, and a lot of the money would be kind of be flowing kind of west to east, if you will. So it seems like a mistake, but um, they decided that they're going to shut down those venues. And so when the, it was a rumor for a while, but to, then you know, they actually got the letters that said they needed to shut down. Um, so that's, that's kind of the limits of what they can do. Um, things like local bitcoins uh, will still exist. Um, it's already kind of, you know, illegal or not, not allowed in you know, places like Argentina, but that's where they need it the most. And so there are things like local bitcoins and, and, and uh, you know, other companies are working on remittance and things like that in those countries where they need it the most. Uh, the banks, I mean, that was the other thing. Jamie Dimon, uh, JP Morgan came out and said it's a fraud and, and that kind of thing, and, which is totally ironic. Um, so, yeah. You could say it. <laughs> it, it it's a, I mean, yeah, they could say anything they want. It's, it's pretty tough. Uh, you know, I know, I know people. You know, it's illegal to mine uh, Bitcoin in Argentina, but there's people doing it. It's dollar and electricity, and and uh, you know, sixteen hundred dollars a month in, in profit. Uh, it's. It can't really be stopped. You could stop the entities. I mean, you could stop the coin bases and things like that. I don't think they will. I don't think they will. Yeah. Okay. 
Yep. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what my gut feel is. I, I, uh, reading a book, uh, the, the, in general, 3.0, uh, 302% per year. So draw a line through that. That's, that's what I use as my metric. Um, and it's, above, it, it's been above that this year, right? So, I mean, it went from 1,000 or something. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, just months ago, you know, it was 1,000. So it, it outpaced the, the rate. So this, this hasn't dropped, it. It's, this drop today has not put it below where I think it's going to be. Uh, it absolutely makes a difference. It's a worldwide currency, so it trades against kind of the rest of the world's currencies and specific things. So it would go up in terms of dollars, right? You already saw that that you know that it would be you know went up and down kind of the euro relative. You know, I mean, it's it's kind of it levels out. We're we're a big dominant part, but so is China. Um, you know, with China gone, that'll change things a little bit. But um, it's a worldwide currency, so as the dollar devalues against the other currencies. One Bitcoin will be worth more dollars just because of the way it works. So if the if the valuation is steep, the curve on Bitcoin would be corresponding. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, it would be more than that. Well, I I've heard it's exponential, but you know I don't know. Oh, well, maybe if everybody's trying to like hedge against it, right? Everybody says, well, it's going down, so I'm going to to hedge use it use it as a hedge, and it may go up faster than it than it ordinarily would. I think uh, Mark's asked me to wrap it up. Thank you.